Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Jeff Weiss from Clearview Trading Advisors. One of my early mentors in the industry has taught me to stay patient, look at the long term, interesting notes of guidance, given what's happening in the market today. Big sell off during, uh, you know, out of the open distribution into the lunchtime, but a nice rally into the close with the Dow actually just barely finishing in the positive. We'll also answer some of your questions from the final bar mailbag. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on these markets using the charts, focusing on the message that the markets themselves provide, helping us understand investor behavior, investor dynamics, uh, where people are excited, where they're euphoric, where they're desperate, where they're nervous, all of that arguably is reflected directly in the uh, in the stock price. That's what John Murphy and Martin Pring taught me in my first couple of books about technical analysis, what I've continued to learn from people like Jeff Weiss, one of my mentors who I'm excited to uh, have on the show today, and many, many others along the way. So overall, you're certainly seeing distribution today, and the selling is, uh, is coming uh, in the most place during those offensive or in those offensive sectors, things like technology, which cannot really get a bid at the moment. Consumer discretionary communication services, those are one, two, three from the bottom. Some sectors are working today. We're gonna to get to all of that and more when we get to our market recap. I did wanna let you know uh, some of the guests we have coming after today, after we talk with Jeff Weiss uh, today. Tomorrow on May 5th, we have Sean McLaughlin from All Star Charts. Uh, Sean's an options expert, so we'll talk a little bit about his perspective, focusing really on equity derivatives, uh, how he's managing this current market. On Thursday, May 6th, Xenia Taubina from XT Financial Services. Xenia is a short-term trader focusing on Elliott Wave, a very different time frame and toolkit than what I use. And I find that's always very interesting to, uh, to, uh, to learn from people that have a different approach than my own. Finally, coming up next week on May 11th, we have Jay Soloff. Jay's been on the show before. He's the lead options analyst at Investors Alley. So it would have been an equity derivative theme to, uh, to the next week or so. It should be fun. Also, as a reminder, I will be speaking at the Money Show uh, virtual event coming up next Wednesday on May 12th. I'll be speaking around 1.30 p.m. Eastern. If you're interested in that, go to moneyshow.com. You can sign up and, uh, and attend that event. But it should be a, a lot of fun. We're going to talk about momentum strategies and risk management, particularly given the seasonally weakest part of the year that started this week. And certainly you're feeling the weakness so far today. Let's continue on with our market recap. We're going to start with a poll. As you probably know, we always have a poll going on our Stock Charts TV live stream. We also have it going through social media and YouTube. Recently, I asked you, know your technical indicators. Which indicator is based on the difference between two exponential moving averages? Your choices were MACD, Stochastics, RSI, Bollinger Bands. I am very proud of Final Bar Nation for crushing this one. 76% of you absolutely right. MACD, the moving average convergence divergence is literally calculated by two exponential moving averages and the difference, the one between the two. Uh, Jerry Apple was the, was the one who created that. And, uh, and his son, Marvin Apple, uh, continues to write research uh, using the, the disciplines that uh, his father had started with. Uh, but overall, you're absolutely right. And my market trend model that we talk about most Fridays on the show uh, is based really on MACD. We have an indicator called PPO, which is very similar to really a derivative of MACD. The others, stochastics, RSI, and Bollinger Bands, a little different. Um, some of them have exponential moving averages built into them. Uh, RSI, for example, is calculated using an exponential average, but in particular, MACD is looking at the two moving averages and when they converge and diverge. So well done, answer correctly, uh, thumbs up. And if you did not answer MACD, I'd encourage you to check out the stockcharts.com chart school, learn more about some of those technical indicators and how they should fit into your process. Continuing with our market recap, you know, I did, uh, I spoke earlier with Mark Chaikin from Chaikin Analytics and we were talking during the market sell-off when it just started to bounce. And, uh, and since we spoke, things have rallied a little bit 
uh, from there. And overall, the Dow finishing in the green, but pretty much everything else was in the red today. And at times, it was a lot worse than it ended up. The S&P closed down around two-thirds of a percent. The NASDAQ down almost 2%. It was down a little more than that uh, a little earlier in the, uh, in the day, but a bit of a rally there going into the close. Uh, but still, uh, you know, very much in distribution mode uh, all around, I would say. I think this is just, you know, short-term buying, but overall, certainly weaker rather than stronger. The VIX is actually back up above 19 for the first time in quite a while. Looking at interest rates, so the 10-year yield was actually down today, and you see financials, one of the top sectors, and, you know, the playbook would be lower yields, underperformance for financials, at least that's what I was uh, led to believe, and that's what the chart really supports, but it re it's a reminder that, Day to day, you can't base one thing just completely off of uh, off of another. Uh, yields actually went down today, but the financial sector did just find out performing the S&P today. The TLT bond prices are up about uh, two thirds of a percent. It's an interesting bounce on there. Higher prices, weaker yields getting back below one and a half percent would be a key tell for me. Uh, you know, telling me that, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I would see that be a flight to safety if, uh, if rates go that low. That means people are, are, are leaving stocks most likely going into the safety of bonds, which would be very much a divergence from what we've seen for a while. The dollar, by the way, up about one half of a percent using the UUP. Commodity prices overall stronger with oil prices leading uh, the way up. Energy was flat for the day, but the USO is up about 2%. Precious metals actually down. So while commodities were uh, up sort of the uh, the defensive side of that, if you will, or the, the gold and silver side of it down today. A lot of movement in cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin. I can't believe I'm mentioning that as part of a market recap, but when I bring up social media, when I bring up my Twitter account, that's what people are throwing around is the latest Dogecoin levels. Uh, but overall, cryptocurrencies net were, uh, were negative today with uh, Bitcoin back below 55,000. This is coming off of the, the uh, lower 60s where it was not too long ago. Continuing our market recap, you know, my my the one chart I would have, and this goes, you know, I, I'm 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 not surprised when I asked Jeff to share a couple of charts today. Its first chart is the chart of the S&P 500. Uh, another mentor of mine, Ralph Akimbora, always told me if you have just one chart to understand the S&P, have it be a daily chart of the S&P. That's all you really need. Everything else is just noise. It's a way to to validate that or better understand it. At the end of the day, just look at the price. And when I look at the price of the S&P, I feel like days like today. Are the, should be the beginning of, of much more. We actually traded down to that line in the sand that we've talked about around 41.20. That was the low from mid-April. We made a new high after that in the, uh, the last week in April, and that was on lower momentum. So you have a momentum divergence, a bearish divergence with higher prices and lower RSI, and that overall usually indicates trend exhaustion. It indicates uh, an end of the uptrend. Now, if you look at when the, that happened last, that was in January, right? We had higher prices there and you had lower momentum, lower RSI. We pulled back around 5%, just under that to the 50-day moving average before resuming the uptrend, which to me tells me that most likely a break below 41.20 indicates uh, a move at the least down to the 50-day moving average, which is around 4,000. Um, that also lines up with a trend line taking the low from October the low from early March and where we're at. For me, that's really, you know, the trigger, the short-term uh, week indicator would be a, a break below really today's low. That would be the, uh, you know, the real line in the sand is that, that level there. If we break that, I think then we're going to start talking about much deeper corrective patterns. What does an S&P 3700 look like? What does an S&P 3200 look like? What would that mean in terms of a, of a percent move? Now, again, is that a likely scenario? I don't know about that. Is it a possible scenario? Absolutely. And, you know, just like I've, I've mentioned before, when you're learning to fly an airplane, they always teach you the, the time that you look for the emergency planning and the time you figure out what airport you would land in if your engine cuts out. It's when things are good. When you're flying straight and level and there are no problems, that's when you're looking for an exit just in case you would need it. You don't wait for the engine to cut out to figure out what you're going to do about it. And the same thing here. When the S&P is coming off of new all-time highs, but showing some of these signs of potential weakness, now would be the time for me to think about what would happen if the S and P went down to, you know, down a, a thousand points? What would, what kind of things would most likely work? What kind of things not? What lines in the sand in my current portfolio or in my, uh, my the things that I'm looking at would indicate to me more of a bearish posturing and make sure that I'm ready for uh, for that sort of thing. You know, it's worth noting a lot of the uh, breadth indicators really aren't updated quite yet for today. A lot of our breadth data runs. Uh, overnight, so or after the close, a little bit later. But you know, one of the charts that I'll be looking at is this one. This is the breadth data 
on the S&P. And it's worth noting that most recently, three of the four of these have been confirming all-time highs in the S&P. The one that has not is small caps. And that's either even with a nice bounce in small caps earlier in the week, you really haven't had any confirmation of, uh, of a breakout there. Uh, other things have uh, have not as well, right? The NASDAQ not really confirming new highs in the S&P in April. So there are, again, some indications of, uh, of some potential topping patterns. Now it's all about the price. And again, S&P 4120 for me is the indication that I would be looking at. Now on a sector basis, I mentioned uh, what was underperforming tech, consumer discretionary communication services, essentially the FANG trade. I'm envisioning as I'm looking at those sectors, charts like Peloton and Zoom and others which have been weak and, and feeling weaker. Peloton arguably breaking down through key support. I'm thinking about the ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK, testing the lower end of a congestion range, checking the 200-day moving average. Is that hold or not? Uh, what is working though, and this is what's interesting, is on a day like this, which felt overall the net pretty negative, some sectors are working just fine. Materials up about 1%. I'm looking at charts of the FCX and specialty chemicals, which aren't bad. The financial sector up two thirds of a percent. I'm thinking of charts like WAL uh, and Ben uh, that are having nice bounces. So while you have a Peloton doing this, showing a very distributive head and shoulders like uh, sort of pattern at the same time, you have a chart like this, uh, uh, Franklin Resources making a new swing high. This is on a day when rates are actually uh, going down, which you know, again, back of the envelope would tell me financials are probably pulling back a bit today. You're not really getting that. You're getting follow through to the upside from financials and industrials. So it's sort of the uh, the infrastructure play, the value play uh, in good shape and holding up. This was about the growth stocks continuing to struggle. That was really the weight on the market from my perspective today. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Jeff Weiss. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the lens of data visualization, using charts and technical indicators to understand the market, quantify investor behavior, and try to understand the evolution of trends. As a reminder, we're going to do another mailbag segment a little later in today's show. We would love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment, which is coming up on Friday's show. Shoot us an email, would you, with any questions that are coming up in your own analytical process. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. Finally, on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. And we'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email, set up a free account. You can watch all of our great content on the new Stock Charts TV on demand. All of our fantastic hosts, our wonderful guests, people like Jeff Weiss and others featured uh, in all of our specials, our documentaries are all on Stock Charts TV on demand. We're also on all the app stores to search for Stock Charts TV. I want to welcome on my guest, Jeff Weiss. Jeff, it's a pleasure as always to have you on the show, but personally, it's a pleasure because as you as you well know, you're one of my mentors. Much of what I've learned, especially to keep it simple, to be patient, to focus on long-term trend lines and how the market reacts to those. You taught me most of those lessons uh, and early in my career and have reinforced them along the way. So it is a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for joining us today. Dave, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Many times we talked about those things when we used to have uh, breakfast at my favorite uh, spot when you were in uh, New York City. I, I miss those uh, breakfasts very much. I, we don't have time to go through the story, but it's worth noting when my daughter, my firstborn was arrived, you and I were having breakfast at that spot that you mentioned, which is a morning I will never forget. Another another webcast we can give into more detail on that. And one. I'm still upset that you left <laughs> left the pancakes to go watch your daughter being born. You have to get my, your my priorities, priorities in order, my man. My priorities were in order for sure. Let's All get right, to let's the get to it. Stuff. The first chart is the S&P 500. We're looking at a, a trend line, really connecting some of the swings in the S&P overall. Talk to us about the big picture. What are you seeing? Well, I see th uh, two trend lines that I think are, are pretty, uh, are, are, are quite interesting. And, you know, when I draw a trend line, uh, I, I give them some room, but realizing the technical analysis is more of an art than, than a science. But still, I, I when I'm drawing a line, I, 
I like to see more than than to uh, area a point to uh, um, uh, occur uh, along it or two two areas. Uh, if you look at the blue one, the blue one dates back to the summer of last year. Look at that middle one that um, you have uh, there, Dave, right to left, and then look at what happened right before the markets collapsed. How we made a higher high, uh, hit the line, and bam, right down. Now recently. Fast forwarding to the last four weekly closes in relation to the blue weekly closing basis trend line, we've managed to close above it. The line at the end of this week is, uh, well, I don't want to get too exact, but it's it, I, I have 4150.08. And it's going to be very interesting uh, realizing how far the market's has gone up. I mean, is it, it may be too much to ask the S&P to hold that line, considering the tremendous distance it's traveled since uh, the March lows last year. But we'll see. Now, below that, the green line uh, connects lows um, uh, and a high, so I would refer to it as an internal trend line, uh, a well-defined line, I might add, and that line is at 3845.82, rough again, 3840 to 3850 in that area. That would be a secondary uh, area to watch. Now, in between there is a daily closing basis trend line that we don't have time to feature, but that line is now at approximately 4,051 and rising 2.07 to 2.08 points per day. And that would be a daily closing basis uh, potential support area should that first blue line in the area of 4150 be violated on this week's weekly close. Looks like we closed around 4160 today, Dave. I was gonna say, and you you taught me early on to always be patient, wait for the weekly close. So we'll have to see how the rest of the week plays out. Chart yes. number two is looking at the value line arithmetic index. What are you seeing here? Yes, and I, I like the, the the weekly day, but realizing unlike you know, 30, 30, 25, you know, 35 years ago, when you could afford to wait for weekly closes, today with the volatility, you're going to uh, I think need to have um and consider having some daily closing uh uh, areas uh, as a backup because you know what used to take uh, you know uh, many months now could take uh, take uh, a month or two and what used to take a month or two can now mm. take several weeks and what used to take several weeks can now be done in a matter of days. So if you take a look at this line, look at those five numbered areas along and around that line. That's what. I love to do. Go back as far as you can while others are looking at the, the, the little stuff and find lines that have stood the test of time so far. Now, the good news is we're, we're so far above it that we can have a, a, a moderate correction and still be in an overall uptrend. Uh, the downside of that is we are now 18% above it as of last week's close, uh, and there is room for us to come down and still be above that line. Uh, so, because we are a you know a rather hefty distance above it, the line at the end of this week should be between 79.84 and 79.85. But notice that it goes back to 2010, more than a decade. Uh, your audience should note. Chart number three, a lot of speculated about growth versus value and, and the NASDAQ composite noticeably has not confirmed new highs in, in the month of April. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting May. Tell us about the NASDAQ. Well, that line you see there, uh, Dave, that goes back to early November, again, a weekly closing chart line, I believe this week at uh, 13th, 335 to 13340 and rising approximately 45.62 to 45.63 points per week. 
Um, I think it's interesting that when we just barely got above it uh, last, uh, what was that, in late late uh, November, um, early December, or whatever, we pulled back to that it, where that first pink arrow is, and we held after a pretty good size rally. Then we went up, made new all time highs, and came back again. So to me, those tests, along with the two blue arrows representing peaks on a weekly closing basis, make this line one to monitor in your NASDAQ and technical chart arsenal. Jeff, we'll have to leave it there. Three great charts. And thanks for looking long-term, focusing on lines in the sand we should be aware of. Stay well, safe. Thanks be well. To your bless your family. Uh, thanks to your audience. God bless all. Please be well. And you take good care, my friend. All good things, everyone. Thanks so much, Jeff. That's Jeff Weiss. Jeff's the technical analyst at Clearview Trading Advisors. And again, I've, I've known Jeff and his work for years. I, I do miss, we, we had some great, when I was lived in the New York area, and even when I was in Boston, would love shooting down and and, uh, and grabbing breakfast when I could, or another meal with uh, with Jeff. We had some really good, really good market and, uh, and other discussions along the way. Let's continue on with our next segment, the final bar mailbag. So one of the great parts of the show is being able to answer your questions that come up in your own process. As a reminder, these have all come from you in the last day or two. If you have questions that are coming up as you're analyzing the markets, Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We would love to hear from you anytime. Question number one, of the 150 stocks making new three-month highs, do you have a sense for which sectors are most pre prevalent relative to their weighting? Cyclical rotation into energy and financial seems to be continuing. This was a couple of days ago, I think, when I ran the, the screen. This is like late last week, I want to say. I ran a screen of, uh, of new highs. Actually, I can tell you when it was. I remember talking about on, on the show that day, it should be down here called New Swing Highs and a date, let's say 420. And by the way, this is one of my favorite things about stock charts is you can actually run the screen, uh, run the scan, you save it as a chart list. And what I do is you have the same name and then the date. So you can actually go back and see when a scan you ran at the beginning of April, what came up and you can see what's happened since then and get a sense of how that screen actually, uh, you know, identified stocks that, uh, that did or did not work. Here we're bringing up um, the, uh, the 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 list that I that I, you asked about it was about 150 stocks that had made new three month uh, three month highs. Yep, um, this was uh, mid net last week that I ran it, and I've grouped them by sectors so you can see what stocks actually uh, came up on the list. Uh, so we can see here. Let's see, a uh, handful of communication services, a good number of discretionary, a decent number of energy. A ton of financials. So to answer your question, I mean, look, I'm still scrolling and there's like a ton. So talk about something that scored much better than its weighting in the S&P uh, would justify. Financials are absolutely the one. Energy to a degree. And I think some of them maybe, uh, you know, depending on when you ran it, would have been more or less. That's still more probably than the weight deserves. But I think the biggest surprise there uh, were two things. One, financials. Two, materials. So materials is about 2%, maybe 3% of the S&P. That might even be overstating it. There are about 12 to 15 materials names. REITs are a rounding error in the S&P, and there's about 10 to 12 of them. Uh, those are the sectors that surprised me. Technology is one of the biggest sectors, and there was a you know about the same as REITs. Uh, there were more REITs than tech. That tells you about the environment. And, and so, again, I think screens are interesting. Scans are interesting, number one, to look for ideas. But what you're alluding to, which is more of a macro indication, what sectors, what groups are bubbling up to the top? I was struck by how many, I have an entire page worth of banks, banks alone, regional banks, larger banks that came up in the screen of new swing highs. Now, again, if we updated this for today, we might find a different composition. But that, for me, reminded me of the strength that we're seeing of financials, which certainly we're, uh, we're seeing follow through today. Next question comes from me. Uh, uh, comes from a question on um, YouTube. I like your depiction of Peloton. My question is: If the neckline is broken, then how much time it might take going down to uh, going down to fifty? Let's bring up the chart of uh, Peloton. This was actually uh, this has the lines on there that I shared probably on the show or on the video that you're looking at. This is probably a good one right here. There we go. So this is showing how the low from November and the low from March is also a 50% retracement of this group. And your question was, if we break this, how long do we go down to 50? And that 50 level, I basically just said the height of this pattern. I said, if the pattern is this high and you do a similar sort of percent move downwards, I don't have the exact number, but it looks like around 50 to 60 would be the downside objective of there. So here's the thing. 
technical indicators, in particular price-based indicators like Fibonacci retracements, don't have a time component. There's no real measurement of, of time to this. It basically says the minimum downside objective would be that, that measurement, sort of in that, that, that 50 range. And again, I could look a little more closely and probably give you a, a better feel of it, but it, it's, it's going to be around 50 or so. So how long does it take? Does that take a month? Does that take a year? Um, you know, I, I would in general tend to think of it symmetrically. So if it took about six months to make that pattern, that suggests about over the next six months, you get down to around the 50 level, given a break of the neckline, which is not quite happening, but, but really, really, really close. Um, and so overall, that's how I would generally think of it. There are disciplines like GAN analysis, like Elliott Wave that try to marry price and time. For me, that's not really part of my toolkit. I focus more on the trend and the price level. And so for me, it's less of a timing thing and more about uh, the price level. And that's the downside objective if we break uh, first. I would note there's an interim support around the 61.8% level, around 76 if we would uh, if we would break that. Uh, last question, then we really have to uh, wrap uh, wrap the show. Do we have breadth metrics for the 104 industry groups? The indicators like GT20, XLRE are quite useful, but they're sector specific. Each sector is comprised of different industry groups. Having an understanding of breadth at the industry level would be very useful. The short answer is no, we really don't. We have some, some random ones that you will find if you search, do a keyword search and look for breadth in an industry group, you might find some, but not very well organized. The problem you have with a lot of industry groups is there aren't a lot of stocks in there. So doing a um, you know uh, something like breadth on a sector is good because you have enough stocks to have a good breadth reading. For some of the smaller industry groups, you have the uh, you know the uh, equity universe is spread around 106 industry groups. So if you do breadth, sometimes it can be a little hairy, and all of a sudden you have this really uh, you know, limited uh, value uh, line. However, part of one of the things we're talking about strategically is beefing up the breadth data. That's something I'm going to be working on hopefully later this year. And that is something I'm going to put on my list right now and make sure that we include that as part of our thought process. Maybe there's something we can do to help you understand industry breadth a little bit better. That's our mailbag segment. Again, shoot us an email when you come up with questions and we'd love to answer them in our next show. Let's get to the three and three, the three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the KRE. This is the regional banks ETF. Again, I'm always reminding people, don't just look at something like the 10-year yield and assume that that tells you absolutely what something like financials or, uh, or anything else will do. There is never a one-on-one -on -one in a vacuum relationship between anything in this world and especially in the financial markets. There are things that will provide headwinds or tailwinds. I would say higher rates are a tailwind to stronger financial performance. Lower rates would be a tailwind, it would be a would be a headwind, would be make it more challenging, but stocks can still do well under either one of those conditions. And today you have the uh, regional bank CTF up 1.6% when rates were actually lower. So don't worry as much about that, but do think about potential rates coming down because in general, that's gonna be a headwind to outperformance. But again, I'm screening for things breaking out. I'm seeing things like the KRE bounce off of the 50 day and it's relatively encouraging. Speaking of that, chart number two is the crude oil chart. Uh, Greg Schnell will probably enjoy the fact if he hears of this, that I'm, uh, I'm talking up oil and energy stocks. He recently, one of his videos, I was joking with him, it was called like bullish on oil and gas. And I joke with him that that, that could be his, uh, his standing title for most shows that he does. And, and, and it's true. He, he has very correctly been, been right on energy, talking about the strength and in oil, the strength in traditional energy stocks, and he knows this space better than anyone I know. Uh, and so I enjoy talking with him about it. And, and I'm seeing what he is seeing. I'm seeing a roll up uh, where crude oil prices are making higher highs and higher lows. I see this as part of an overall strength in commodities. I do think things like gold and precious metals will, will be a part of that more than they may have been uh, recently. But I'm seeing nice constructive bouncing off the 50-day moving average for crude oil prices. Finally, we finished the mailbag segment looking at Peloton. Again, I don't want to keep throwing this stock under the bus. It may work beautifully from here. However, given a scenario where I see a lot of stocks rotating higher, I see industry groups working like materials and energy. Is there? Am I tempted to take it something like Peloton? Not at all, because I'm seeing it break down and I'm seeing more of a distributive pattern. We are really close to a breakdown of support. That would be a warning sign for me. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Jeff Weiss joining us from the New York area, sharing his thoughts on the market. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.